Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome journalist from La Pointe, Malik Diawara. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic of uh, choice today is that of creating a legal framework for the Africa of the future. To start, we could always already say that Africa didn't wasn't didn't wait for us to start thinking about this. They already started their legal construction in order to improve uh, the future. For example, the Organization for the Harmonization of uh, Business, which groups together uh, the French-speaking in, in, in the Western and Central Africa, the Economic Court of Justice in the states of uh, Africa, the ECOWAS and the Rocha, without uh, forgetting the initiatives ongoing and that have not yet produced their fruit. It appears that one of the essential uh, elements of our panel is to see together the ways and means in order to uh, lead to a reliable and viable construction of a legal framework for Africa, Africa which today is showing signs of a continent uh, changing its destiny. It seems to me that this construction will happen on several levels. First of all, within each country, uh, there will be consolidation, uh, taking into account the social, economic, political, and the political context, the state, the national institutions, in their relationship with the population, but also the relationship between legal entities, between physical people as well. All of this in the context of acceleration and change uh, in terms of the economy in the African continent in its own structure, but also in its relationship with the outside world that today uh, is coming to fruition. So the second level, subsequently, in the real will to create a complementary uh, programs and to harmonize legislation so as to accompany uh, business which is called upon to develop uh, not towards the north, but between African countries, which they as well will be growing because Africa is uh, uh, moving towards integration increasingly, and to accompany the security of countries and people through various measures against terrorism and new types of crime. Since we are at the crossroads and at the NIFA, these are opportunities for growth in business in Africa with the intervention of many operators, both economic, political, very certainly, technological, certainly. Uh, it is obvious that uh, in addition to the proper governance, we also need to build a, a good legal governance which will make reliable all of the, ac the actions taken elsewhere, all of the investments made as well. This, I believe, um, is what we're going to be talking about uh, in this panel. To go further, we have with us today Mrs. Uh, Sudeni Oué, who is the, uh, the uh, Avocat General. Mr. Jean-Luc uh, Cunan, who is the managing director of the COFINA in Senegal. They deal with informal structure financing, microfinance, uh, for uh, activities that are too small for traditional financing methods. We have Stefan Karen Gizi from Uganda, who is the director of the African Legal Support Facility in the African Development Bank. We have Mr. Olivier, uh, Pierre Olivier Sur, who is the former bâtonnier of the Paris Bar. And we have Mr. Vincent Miel, who is the legal counsel for the African Union Commission. The first question will be uh, asked of of Mrs. Diawara. If you have to imagine a legal framework and the perspectives of Africa tomorrow, what do you think we have to do first? Thank you, Mr. Malik. 
If the question is setting up a legal framework for the Africa of the future, the idea that comes to mind, and which is shared by most of the panelists here today, is that of creating conditions that will make it possible for governors to work and political decision makers so that economic operators in Africa can then uh, put into place the uh, means of working in a secure fashion. What we're observing today is that many economic operators, even though they are in good faith, they create companies in the informal uh, economy. How can we make it so that we can create a framework that will encourage people and, and to make these businesses more secure? Uh, for the moment, they're, in, they're informal. How do we bring them into the fold? And the now, this type of, acti of action will create a basis for legislation and so that the government can put into place uh, more legislation to encourage these types of companies uh, to move from informal to formal. Because what we're observing as well is that these companies are, are, are a legion, more than half of the companies that exist today, if you count uh, the companies that uh, are working in the formal activity. Uh, so the objective sought the participants will be re reporting back on proposals that are made so that each country in Africa can take those into account in what they're going to do and move subsequently towards harmonization by taking into account these very proposals since the economic operators in Africa are involved throughout the country. You can very well imagine uh, an economic operator in Gabon that could also work in Congo, Senegal, and Mali. So the objective, as I was saying, is to continue setting up a kind of harmonization as in the framework of uh, organization of business law. So the legal framework, as uh, sketched out by our panel here today, is seeking nothing other than thinking about setting up legislation that would be adequate and that could then uh, be dealt with in a communitary uh, campus so as to encourage and secure uh, business that are people that are working in informal and formal areas. It's very interesting that you spoke about the question of the informal economy. When you're talking about informal economy, you're looking at uh, Africa deep in their eyes. It's half of Africa. We're talking about growth. You're giving figures and so forth. This is the sector that is almost not taken into account at all. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. African growth we're talking about today is growth that is ultimately doesn't take into account half of the energy present in this continent. And since the topic of the UNIFA today is to talk about energy, I think it's extremely relevant to talk about, first of all, uh, this uh, informal economy. So. Jean-Luc Coman, who is the managing director of Cofina, which is a structure which is mezzo-finance, in other words, companies that are too small, I'm sorry, too big to be financed by microfinancing activities and too small to, uh, to be funded by uh, structures that are more classical funding uh, providers. So what is your view on the approach today that is being adopted by governments and the different operators in the informal market. Thank you, Malik. Well, I thought at the beginning, you know, what approach uh, should we have in this panel? I have uh, eminent legal specialists around here, around me, and I'm not one myself. So basically, I think it would be useful to talk about the problem in a different way. This is a wonderful opportunity here that I have to represent uh, entrepreneurs and, opera and economic operators. We talked about 50% of informal. I think that's quite far from the truth. It's more than 
of the economy that is comprised of a small and medium-sized companies. In other words, informal companies and more or less formal companies. Look, think for a minute about the customer. We have economic operators, the suppliers, you have decision makers, and engineers that are supposed to be designing products are legal experts advising the governments. So what do actual uh, economic operators want? What do they want? I think they want three things. The first thing that is vital is to create their company quickly and at a low cost. What we observe is that Africa has a, ge a variable geometry. You could have a panel where you're going to have Singapore, you're going to have uh, uh, Mauritius, Côte d'Ivoire, Senegal, and you can create a company in less than seven days. I'm talking about realities, not what's being said. You have Gabon, Chad, between 50 and 60. Days. So you can see there's a variable geometry. But about the cost, you're going to get into a situation where the average cost for creating a company compared to the revenue of the population is only 12% in Gabon as compared to 63% in Senegal, which is in the lead, leaders in the pack. So the, it, the geometry is indeed variable. From a point of view now, of a tax point of view, that it just harmonize the tax uh, issues as well and it's more or less at rates that are fairly consensual. Uh, however, the most important thing, and I think that's what we should be focusing on, is that once we've created a company, what help is given? What's the legal framework that will help me to uh, move forward with my new company? We have system, classical systems, a banking system, microfinance, and financial institutions. But there's something new happening, uh, which is not specific to Africa, but which is reaching Africa, and that is digitalization of our economy. In other words, we are moving from an economy that is based on something physical, which is based on something that is digital. And the proof of that today, with the development of our economy, is the translation of what was happening under the code into something that is now digital. The biggest hotel chain in the world today that you see in Africa, in Johannesburg, Abidjan, and Dakar, does not have a single bed. This is Airbnb. This is the principle by which you can rent a, 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 a room. You can go to Paris and rent a room at someone's home without even knowing who you're dealing with. It, it's just an intermediary activity. And this is gaining Africa. Uh, there's 20% more um, offers via Airbnb than uh, offers by Hilton. So things are changing in this respect, and legislation has to catch up because this is happening now today. Um, if you mix things up with what's going on in the market here, and you can see this in other markets, there's an underground economy that has to be brought back to the formal economy, and digital lets you go from informal to formal. So to summarize, you create a company, you digitalize it, to move towards informal, you're accompanied, and that makes it possible to bring it back into the formal sphere, which you could call the virtuous cycle of emergence. Stefan, Karen Gizzi, you are director of African uh, facility, the bank, the African bank. How, in your structure, do you approach this issue of the formal activity and informal activity and how should we work on that to harmonize things? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Malik. First of all, a clarification. The facility is an independent institution, independent of the bank. We provide support to countries in the context of negotiations and capacity building. With respect to the issue I've re raised, I probably wanted to move the debate back or the discussion back to the bigger picture. When you are talking about developing legal frameworks, developing legislation, in terms of law, we talk of the law being dynamic. One would expect that you develop legislation, law, that is appropriate to your situation in your country or your region. Unfortunately, most of the legislation or the legal frameworks we've developed in Africa have been reactive and have also been uh, repetitive of what others do. In most cases, we copy legislation or laws or legal framework handed down to us 
um, from other jurisdictions <coughs> without adapting them to your local conditions. So we all had exactly the same investment codes. We had exactly the same uh, fiscal laws, which were not adapted to the situations obtaining in the, in the different jurisdictions. That's how you come about having that situation. Where you, when you say this, it is because you're, you're thinking of imported European legislation, is that correct? Exactly. So that's why you came about with such a situation where the legislation did not address those local kind of issues you are talking about, the informal sector and so on. But more than the legal frameworks, I think the, the two colleagues have touched upon it, is the issue of institutions. You create the legal frameworks, but you do not have the institutions to translate that into uh, the necessary uh, benefits uh, for the people. An enabling environment for business, an enabling environment for, for investment. When you talk about technology, we need to be a bit more proactive in terms of adapting our legal frameworks to the opportunities which arise. Take banking. When you look at banking, the majority of our people do not bank and will, are not likely to do any banking for the foreseeable future. But if you see what has happened in the recent past, where mobile money has been introduced, you have banking taking place. That's a form of banking that the ordinary people are, are taking advantage of. So how do you develop your legal framework to adapt to that situation? So I think that's the missing link. I mean, when you talk of a country like Kenya, you have 27 million out of a population of 42 million that have mobile bank accounts. For most of those people, 95% of them, if you ask them if they have a bank account, they'll tell you no, and they are not likely to. So I think that's the kind of adaptability that we need to start taking, taking account of. Legal frameworks that reflect the needs of the people and building institutions that will be able to deliver on the expected benefits out of the reforms that we, we undertake that are accompanied with new legal frameworks. Can you today give us examples of countries that have already traveled down that road somewhat and that could enlighten other countries? Um, it's very difficult to give specific examples, but I can say that for quite a number of countries, for instance, in the financial field, they've started developing um, legal frameworks to take account of, um, for instance, the informal sector. There is development of um, legal frameworks for savings, uh, savings and uh, saving societies uh, that would be able to marshal saved resources at smaller level so that you have lending. Uh, I think in East Africa you have also appropriate legal frameworks being developed for microfinance, um, but that is talking of the micro level. I think for the larger legal frameworks at, nation, at national level, we have quite a few innovations taking place. And we have also had reaction to situations where, for instance, the original investment codes all provided for incentives for foreign investors. For most of our countries, because of the pressure of the local investors, you now have more even investment codes that allow local investors to be recognized with the equal status and to benefit from the same incentives that were original, originally given to foreign investors that never turned up in the first place. Or if they turned up, took advantage of the tax holidays because they were just copying the same legislation, same legal framework. And then after the tax holidays ended, they took off to another state, took the same. So we now have even playing field between them and the local investors. That's the kind of innovations that we need to go towards because the local investors will never leave. So you have to give them the same incentives 
as you are giving the foreign investors. Bien sûr. Maître Pierre-Olivier Sur, uh, on a parlé de, de la législation des pays occidentaux. Talked about the legislation in the Western countries, which expected a lot uh, from of, of this type of uh, legislation in, in, in the South, in, about Europe, uh, the US, African countries. What lessons can be learned from what was said? Thank you. I'm very happy uh, to, uh, to speak at this point about uh, in this forum. There are a certain number of similarities that are obvious with an overturning of uh, the relationship between various forces. One thing is certain, uh, first of all, Africa, in one generation, will constitute two billion human beings. And the second certainty, as uh, was said by the Prime Minister, a few moments ago, the second certainty is that Africa, without being overly optimistic, but be simply, being simply realistic, will be in the future one of the locomotives in the world. And this is obviously an overturning of the forces in play. But there's one condition for that. And the condition is, as the Prime Minister said, uh, electricity for all, obviously, and that uh, the program put forward by Jean-Louis Borloo uh, is just about that. The essential condition for me is law, which is the, uh, the vehicle of law. And the vehicle of law is, first of all, political stability. It is also, obviously, the ability to do business. And the vehicle of law is to share wealth. The vehicle of law is essential. And now we need to see how exactly dreaming about a, a legal framework for, and for the law and under the law, I have nothing to teach to anyone about that. In France, justice is not doing well. In France, the legal instrument is extremely uh, behind. The proof is that the French, we are actually um, criticized by the Inter International Court, Court of Justice. In Gabon, the bâtonnier Jean-Pierre Akumbu, with whom I spoke at length yesterday, was saying to me that one of the proofs that the place of law is not yet balanced is its absence today in, uh, in the Tribune. I'd like to welcome the presence of the uh, Prosecutor of the Republic here today. So there's a real imbalance between uh, prosecution and defense. And the place of lawyers in society with the bâtonnier is in question. And, and the exercise of law is the acceptance of submission to supranational law, as you were saying in your introduction. The submission to OADA law, the submission to the court which is there to protect human rights, whether it be in Abuja or anywhere else. And it is that very integration by a supranational law that will protect us against corruption within member states and judges. Here in Gabon, in France, uh, we're not far from that, even if uh, it is manifested uh, sometimes quite differently. So yes to development of Africa, yes to Africa being a locomotive in the world and uh, for Europe as well. But the condition for that is that we need the necessary vehicle, which is that of the law. And to do that, let's issue a call to our politicians and our economic partners to submit to a law that's better integrated and more uh, fully featured. 
As the uh, bâtonnier said yesterday, and as others have since said, uh, some of our legal counsels in tax law, for example, here, there are some missing links, which are nonetheless necessary to understanding sophisticated methods in play to build a company. Let's not look uh, too far away, too far afield. We don't need to look to European or French uh, law. We have to create our own law here. Let's do it together. And first and foremost, in the wonderful framework of the RADA, which we uh, really do need uh, to develop further in order to provide a better way of working together and first and foremost at the service of African lawyers. Because today the problem of the system, the legal and judicial system in Africa, is that we are calling too much upon international law offices uh, from Paris or elsewhere. We need to be on an equal fit footing. The, the, the courts of law in Africa need to group together to be more demanding. They need more training and financial security in order to support the basic ground movement to transform procedures via the CARPA models. This is a very ambitious program, but it is a strong idea indeed. Africa will be there. They will be the locomotive in the future, but this requires the presence of law. Thank you. Mr. Vincent Mayle, legal director, legal counsel of the African Union Commission, could you say how in the uh, African Union you are organized to balance the relationship between governments and populations? And then what's the relationship between the various populations and individuals? To, to, to construct, to build this uh, legal supranationality in Africa. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, for, for your question. But before I answer your question, let me pay tribute to the organizers of this um, event and also specifically to the African Association of International Law, on whose platform I sit to be able to speak to you. Um, regarding your question, let me just preface your, my answer with this. I don't think there's anything new about Africa that we need to think about. The only thing new that we need to think about is for Africa to think Africa and not bother itself about colonial ties and speak for the interests of Africa and Africa alone. That is the only new thing we need to do. And then secondly, in terms of the framework with regard to the populations and the people of Africa, I just want to remind you about the vision of the African Union, which is an Africa that is at peace with itself, driven by its own citizens, and representing a dynamic force in the world, in, 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 in a dynamic force in global affairs. Now, that speaks specifically to the need for Africa to begin to use its citizenry to affect what happens and its relations with the world. Of course, the recent vision of the African Union is the African Union Agenda 2063, which is basically calling upon Africa and its citizens to participate in the development of Africa by itself, which must be done by African citizens. That has received input from virtually all segments of African society, from civil society, student populations, academics, industry, for the new Africa that we want for the next 50 years taking into account the formation of the Af Organization of African Unity and its transition to the African Union in 2002. So basically, it is a people-driven organization that has turned the tide in terms of the involvement of the people. Now, with regard to legal frameworks, I do not believe that we need any more new legal frameworks because the Constitutive Act of the African Union has crystallized the Africa we want to achieve, the union of African people. And there are lots of instruments that have been adopted to be able to realize this. There are 49 treaties that have been adopted up to present since 1963. And each of those treaties looks forward to 
if you like, an African integration which started basically with the Abuja Treaty of 1990. I think the most important thing is how can Africa work together without the vestiges of colonialism which tries to divide us rather than bring us together. And we should be thinking about an African integration that makes it easier for African people to move about. Somebody from France comes in here easily without a visa, and the next person from, coming from Cameroon is put in a situation where he must require a visa to come here. Then what integration are we talking about? And therefore, <laughs> and therefore, we must begin to think about an Africa that ties with the rest of African people together. And it must take our leaders to do that. Let me remind you that we're in the process of launching a protocol on the free movement of persons across the African continent. And we're also in the process of launching the African passport that will make member states issue one single passport for African people to travel around Africa. And finally, let me remind you of the need for each and every one of us to begin to think purely African and therefore need for harmonization of legal instruments that currently exist. Yes, Ohada may be celebrated, but at the same time, Ohada needs to think beyond the Central African and the French-speaking community of Africa to talk about the rest of Africa together. Thank you very much. Hello. Ce que vous avez dit, ce que vous avez dit est extrêmement intéressant parce que il me semble que what you've just said is very interesting. In order for law to be properly applied, it must be bought in by our populations. And you were talking about aspirations, and aspirations and inspiration must be African. I'd like to ask you one question. Today, in your different commissions, do you have an approach to law that takes into account the law as it existed in the African kingdoms, in the different zones, in the African empires, and so on? Because we spoke uh, of uh, different uh, issues. And I would like you to tell us where you place the law before the, con the colonial era. And the question to Mrs. Oué. Avant de répondre à cette question, je voudrais quand même revenir sur quelque chose. Before uh, I answer the question, I would like to return to a point that is important to me. In other words, the representation in front of an assembly of this nature must not be the, uh, a, a preacher's lectern. Uh, the president of the Bar Association was saying uh, earlier on that we need law. We need law that goes beyond politics, beyond the economy and uh, also beyond what regulates behaviors and relationships, relationships between citizens. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this may be an error that we uh, could uh, feel stems from uh, the organizers, but I think that the idea of the organizers, in other words, within the framework <clears throat> of an assembly such as this one, we need to take a larger view. And the goal is not to choose only within Africa. The idea is also to have a fresh eyes review, so to speak. And therefore, based on this experience, to develop another legal environment. And this is the position of the president of the Bar Association. And the presence of the court as well to take into account these observations. The role of defense is quite clear in an organization that is respectful of the law. And this brings me to think that defense 
in a wider vision than that limited to Gabon cannot be limited to the Bar Association of Gabon. We could call upon the president of the Bar Association of Senegal or of Rwanda or Uganda and more, pan-African, so to speak. It was important for me to return to this point to justify and to ensure that this does not appear to be that we always tend to look outside even though we have local resources of importance. Now, to return to your question, uh, in other words, do we take into account our traditions in the development of legal texts to eliminate a, the idea of colonialism and in sub-regional, regional or African legislations, I believe that our culture is a verbal culture with its own traditions. It's a spoken tradition. But we are in a world that is green. It is not just composed of Africa and those who unfortunately set down the foundations of foundation and law, of legislation and law. And we had, of course, uh, the uh, uh, American law. Uh, we also had our customary law. And these are the Western countries uh, that uh, built the foundation. So traditional law, customary law, and Western law can be combined to create a new legislative approach today that is adapted to uh, what our goals of today actually cover. And I think that uh, this uh, combination is included in the discussions that lead to the development of the texts. Mr. Stephen Karangizi, how does this work in terms of facilitation of the legal situations with respect to customary law, local law, and African law? And then perhaps Mr. Vincent Mienel will respond to that as well. We have um, kind of evolved uh, beyond that question in, in that in the last 20, 30 years, there's been an awakening on the need of retaining customary laws that are, are relevant to our situation, uh, but also doing away with those customary laws that are an impediment uh, to our development. We don't need to get stuck with certain customary laws. I mean, the clear example is customary laws that impede opportunities for women. For instance, women previously could not obtain title for land in many of our countries because of the customary law. They had to get permission of their uh, spouses. So, I mean, we have to differentiate between the good customs and the um, customs that impede development. I think we've passed that stage. Um, so in the bigger context, that's why I was saying we need to look at the opportunities which we have. And what are those opportunities which, which we have? When I look at the youth, how do you address that problem? There are certain impediments that are still in place in terms of the legal frameworks that we inherited that impede opportunities for youth, which have been addressed in some countries. For instance, Procurement, we all have procurement laws which are based purely on competitiveness but do not give an advantage to certain sectors of our society to be able to be included in, in economic participation. You take South Africa, they've modified their procurement law to require companies to include participation of small scale entities a minimum amount of 20, 25% for them to qualify for procurement. So those are the kind of things uh, we should be talking about. You talk about the lost op opportunity cost. I don't know whether you know that, for instance, Western Union probably 
takes maybe between 10 and 20 percent of remittances that the ordinary people should be getting because of the high cost of using uh, Western Union. How do we modify our legal framework to take advantage of the remittances of, the, of our people so that you can have that income retained here? So I think those are the things you need, we need to talk about. Time has, has evolved. We still have some customary issues that hold us back, and we need to address them, I agree. But I think we need to start looking uh, forward more. And I think we still come back to the major problem, which was already identified in terms of, it's not just the legal framework. It's also what we now call soft law, the enabling environment reducing the cost of doing business. If somebody wants to establish a company, it shouldn't take so long. It should be easier for that person to know how to get information on taxation. It should be easier for people to get credit without having security. So you need to create that enabling environment. I think that's still the missing link. We've not yet created sufficient legal framework for moving towards that. And we also need to then have institutions that back that up sufficiently. Thank you. In terms of customary law, law on terms. the so-called laws that existed prior to colonial rule, let me just say that there's a place for customary law. Um, because if you look at African settings, there are a number of areas where customary law proves to be very useful. Issues of land, for example, communal ownership of land. Of course, the received French or English law will tell you about the individual, where one man can own the entire Gabon and prides himself to be the owner of the land while the community suffers, may not even have um, areas to farm. Now, from the customary law that I know that still exists in a number of places, land can hardly be owned by one person thereby enabling communities to be able to have access to land for purposes of farming and for purposes of building houses. For example, in my village, I don't need to buy land. All I need to do is go to the chief, say I'm up to age, I want to own a home, and he says, that's wonderful, that's what we're praying for. In accordance with our custom, we'll allocate land to you to build your house. Now, we seem to have lost that in a number of our African settings. I think we need to resurrect the benefits of African customary law, particularly with regards to allocation of land as a communal land. Of course, customary law can be reformed in line with current realities because culture is dynamic. And of course, from the knowledge of law relative to uh, received English law relative to customary law, there was the qualification that customary law needed to abide by, needed to be incongruent what is referred to as equity and good conscience and not repugnant to natural justice. Steve had alluded to the fact of a number of customary law that denied women access to inheritance and all that. That needs to be reformed. Another area where we need good customary law is in conflict resolution. In Africa, of course, conflict resolution can be dealt with more at the communal level than the regular court processes that makes us enemies forever. But customary law has a way of bringing us together to resolve our disputes. Thank you. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Alors, on l'aura compris, on l'aura compris. We've understood that uh, Africa has an incredible growth rate. We say that Africa is the continent of the future, but one thing is certain. If you look at the ideas that have been put forward today, Africa cannot be built uh, without Africa. It can't be built without taking into account its cultural memory, the social memory, and the legal memory, judicial memory, and the realities of half of the informal areas. We talked about that. That shows that the African continent has, is very specific. We have to take that specificity into account for the future so that we can build an Africa for the future. And, and an Africa that is uh, winning. Thank you very much.